ピーチは不安だったいつもはマリオに助けられるのに Ah、uh, yes The eye Objectively the third best organ But when ranking the eye against all other organs, some of the pros to consider include the accessibility of the retina for neural research, the incredible process of e m e t r o p i z a t i o n and the delicious, smooth taste of the aqueous humor. Let me try. <laughs> Lick eyes. Some of the cons include undefended access to the soul, the horrified susceptibility to piercing damage, The extraordinary difficulty in accessing non corneal ocular tissue from donors for research in some places, and the delicious, smooth taste of the aqueous humor. A further interesting bit of eye information, huh? Huh? Is that our eyes are getting bigger. But not in a cool, as nutrition levels have risen, humans have grown taller sort of way, but in the half of the world's population will have myopia by the year 2050 sort of way. So, this spooky statistic has made refractive error diseases an increasingly important area of study, and a valuable method of performing research on biological systems is through utilizing model organisms. In this video, we can use the eye and myopia as an example system and disease state for examining the benefits, limitations, and ethical considerations of using model organisms in research, unless we get horrifically sidetracked by some nonsense. A good place to start might be at some of the first myopia associated experiments, where the primary impetus for research was animal cruelty and realizing there was some valuable information to be gained was serendipitous. These early experiments involved fusing monkeys' eyelids shut and evolved to fusing other animals' eyelids shut too, like tree shrews, cats, and chickens. Once they realized fusing animals' eyelids shut was a cancelable offense, researchers moved on to using lenses and playing around with light with only the occasional eyelid suture as a treat. What was clear was that visual input appeared to have a very substantial impact on the refractive capacity of the eye. But the models that had been in research involved eyelid surgeries formed the typical roster of species that have routinely been used as model organisms for refractive error. Apart from rodents, what you may notice are missing are some classic model organisms that you'd typically expect to see being used for fundamental biological principles or genetic pathways that may be applicable to refractive error. But you'll also notice this timeline isn't full. Around here, genome wide association studies were developed, which allowed us to find low effect size genetic factors associated with diseases. Suddenly, There were hundreds of genes associated with myopia, and a distressingly low capacity to investigate them. There was now a need for higher throughput experiments to assess genetic components which might have only a very marginal impact on the overall disease state, for which monkey with eyelids fused, chickens living in hell, or daughter having her ocular development non consensually manipulated with filtered lenses are not suitable. To fill this gap, we could look to other research centered on the eye. For example, other ocular pathologies or neural research. And, oh, a zebrafish. What a cute young friend. But not just a friend, also an animal with substantial value as a high throughput model organism. So now let's look at some of these model organisms, starting with the most recent ones and working backwards. Part 1 Zebrafish. When we have a cheeky peek under the sea, Well, they're actually freshwater fish, so it would be under the. What the fuck? Are my eyes deceiving me? Is one of Ariel's watsets some spectacles which somehow appear to be causing very substantial refraction underwater? What on earth is going on? Part 1A Immediately getting sidetracked by some nonsense. Now I know your mind is racing with possibilities. Because we're all aware of the large number of K dramas that involve fish with glasses, and it might just be possible that the perfect model organism for myopia already exists, blending the high throughput capacity of the little zebrafish with extremely high genetic and structural ocular similarity to humans. Maybe media could teach scientists a thing or two, and they could stop wasting their time with research and experiments. First, we need a little aside on refraction. When light passes from one transparent thing into a different transparent thing, it bends. Now, old peepers rely upon this fact because they evolved under the selection pressure of 
reality. Anyway, our cornea is where the majority of this happens in our terrestrial eyes, because light moving from air to cornea stuff causes significant refraction. However, cornea stuff and water are very similar, so effectively no refraction occurs for light moving from one to the other. However, in all our media examples, the eyes function exactly as terrestrial eyes, but in an aquatic environment. We can hypothesize whatever we want, it doesn't matter, because the observable reality is that these eyes function identically to our human eyes. In media, there are three broad categories of myopic fish that often come up. Fish, fish people, and people fish. We can now consider the pros and cons of using each of these types of myopic media fish as model organisms for research. Part 2. Fish. The most boring of the four-eyed fish nerds in media are the fish that are fish, and through whatever nefarious means we've been afforded a horrifying peek behind the curtain of their lives. The perfect example is the 1999 TV adaptation of Marcus Fister's children's book, Rainbow Fish. Among the cast of characters with worryingly human faces, we see a couple of spectacled fish. The most ripe episode for our purposes is episode 13, Sir Sword Goes Back to School, which to my supreme delight is available right here on YouTube. In this episode exploring Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punishment, we see both Sir Sword and the teacher Mrs. Chips wearing glasses in the ubiquitous manner you'd typically expect for myopia, but of course many people with hyperopia wear their glasses all the time too, so it's impossible to be certain. Either way, we're seeing refractive error treated with lenses. Let's look at our new friends as models for myopia, and we might think they'd just be better versions of real life fish, and in some ways, yes. The way our fishy friends perceive their environment is indistinguishable from how we humans see our environment, meaning that their eyes are likely functionally identical, uh, accounting for the environmental differences, which is huge. Now if they have all the benefits of real fish, we might have a perfect model organism. Unfortunately, the fish appear to have either equivalent or longer lifespans than humans, with the eponymous rainbow fish spending the entirety of the year 2000 in grade 3, with no obvious ageing across the weekly episodes that aired. Additionally, the fish have very clear case selection reproductive strategies, meaning they invest heavily into their offspring and tend to produce a small number, with a relatively high likelihood of reaching adulthood in a manner similarly as to what we observe commonly in humans, with social and probably genetic monogamy both exhibited. These more human-like traits, unfortunately, mean these types of fish are probably not great for high-throughput experimental procedures for modelling disease. Part 3. Fish People What this video has metamorphosed into is obviously complete nonsense. But one thing that adds to the silliness is that the fish and the fish people are effectively identical in each of their respective texts. They're just people. So too are their ocular form and function. So what this means is, for determining suitability for modelling disease, all we care about is the reproductive capacity and maybe ethical constraints. Now to lend fantastic evidence to grouping all fish people into one species is a niche little cartoon called SpongeBob SquarePants. The key to this is Patrick Starr's family tree, showing the young Asteroidea being related to all sorts of creatures from ostensibly different species. The other major characters' family trees also demonstrate the reproductive problem we hit with rainbow fish, being very clear case selection reproductive strategies. This is particularly disappointing as we've got a real abundance of glasses wearing characters throughout the show. Now. Earlier in this video, back when I was going to actually talk seriously about pros and cons of different model organisms, I said we'd explore the ethical considerations, and that was going to be a lie, until I was punched in the face by a bizarre, gritty little cop show called Fish Police from the 90s, based on a manga of the same name from the 80s, and boy is it a product of its time. Angel could be completely innocent. Not since she was 14. Now all the same features apply. The spectacled anthropomorphic fish and extraordinarily human-like reproductive features, making them just as valuable or not valuable as everything else mentioned so far. 
But novel feature here is that not only do we have these anthropomorphic fish, we also have standard run-of-the-mill fish. These fish appear to be functionally birds, except the ones which are clearly pet fish. Horrifying to consider. Like all the best things, we've got a framework called the three R's yeah. in animal use in research. Replacement, reduction, and refinement. We use this as a way to consider the ethics of using animals in research and the humane and responsible care of those animals. The behavior of the animal has been radically changed by this training. Refinement refers to methods which we don't care about here. Reduction is an important statistical consideration to ensure validity without waste. Again, we don't care about it here, but the one we care about is replacement, where we try to achieve similar outcomes without using animals. For example, by performing in silico experiments. However, we can also think about it in terms of partial replacement, where we might use tissue from animals that have already been killed for an unrelated reason. Or we might use immature vertebrates like larvae or embryos, or use classic plant, fungal, bacterial or invertebrate models instead of vertebrates. The goal of these partial replacement methods is to minimise suffering and distress. Now a final way to consider partial replacement is by thinking about different types of vertebrates in a hierarchy. When we talk about using something like a fruit fly instead of a mouse, most people think that's a reasonable replacement. But is replacing, say, a macaque with a mouse also reasonable? How about replacing a mouse with a fish? Different people would probably find different lines where a replacement could be considered reasonable. Now when we think about the fish that aren't people in a fish police, what can we say about their experience of pain? Do we know if they have a conception of the self and can consider their experience in the context of suffering? We don't know and as such must assume the answer is no, so we can do whatever horrific thing we want to them. The problem here is that the very reasonable and scientifically valid assumption about perceiving the environment we've made for the characters up to this point doesn't necessarily hold for the fish that are actually fish. Unfortunately, this thinking may lead to this very serious video becoming a farce. Part 4. People Fish this incorporates people who transform into fish, as in a fish tail, which I'm guessing you'd probably know better as Hyol, Jäger and Fisk, or The Incredible Mr. Limpet, two masterful pieces of cinema, but both useless and boring, because the four-eyed freaks are functionally identical to the fish people we just looked at. However, near the end of season 3 of H2O, Just Add Water, best girl, your friend and mine, Cleo Satori, starts wearing glasses. Oh, and DNA code for amino acid, I'm sure they'll ask us about that. Have you reviewed that too? I will. The question now on everyone's mind is, do mermaids spawn like many teleosts? Is that scrambled eggs? Well, I thought it might get you off to a good start. It was supposed to be breakfast in bed. So, never too late. Bon appetit too. That's French. Adieu, mon coquille.